I doubled my salary overnight. Um, but it doesn't necessarily make you happy and it doesn't necessarily help. It, it's around culture is so important in a business. Something like 36% of all shopping was online during COVID. It dropped back, it's dropped back to about 28%, but that is still massively higher than it was in 2019. And that path is still, you know, is still gonna go. So I think that e-commerce piece will continue to drive the market. Yeah, it's one of the few sectors where you can start work on the shop floor and you can be CEO. You know, the number of women in the sector is, is, is growing and, and, you know, really important. The amount of people who've never had a degree who've gone through that sector as well. It, it, it's a real sort of hidden gem. Today on the People, Property, Place podcast, I'm joined by Paul Weston, Senior Vice President and Regional Head of Prologis UK. Prologis is the global leader in logistics real estate with a focus on high barrier, high growth markets. As of the 30th of June, 2024, the company owned or had investments in properties and development projects expected to total approximately 1.2 billion square feet in 19 countries with approximately 6,700 customers. Paul has worked in the UK industrial and logistics sector for 30 years and began his career in industrial agency at JLL before working with Gaisley, now GLP, and Brixton PLC, now part of Seagro, joining Prologis in 2003. Together with the executive team, Paul is responsible for setting the strategic direction for the UK business and also works closely with the European and global leadership teams. Westy, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Matt. It's great to be here. Not at all. Well, look, um, I'm really excited to get tucked in uh, to your career and experience and also find out a little bit more about Prologis and how you see the market. But a place that we always start these conversations is how and why did you get into real estate? Because you did a geography degree, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm going to come clean. I did a <laughs> general studies, open bracket, geography, closed bracket degree. And I'm saying that because my kids will slaughter me if I don't if I don't say that. So actually, I started off doing joint honours, French and uh, geography at Birmingham University. Um, I, I chose to do a couple of subjects that I really enjoyed at, at school. Um, unfortunately, the French was a bit hard. I got through <laughs> on a reset at the end of my first year, but then I decided actually... Maybe I just need to pivot. So I did, it's a bit like an American degree. You did sort of two thirds of a geography degree and then you were able to choose a couple of minor subjects each year. So uh, yeah, I, I got through uh, university um, unscathed, I think, uh, and really enjoyed it. And it, it's interesting because I didn't know about real estate at the time. I mean, it, it, was, it wasn't something that was a natural career path at, at a Red Brick University in those days for me anyway. And I... Um, I've been a social secretary at, at, at university and I was organising gigs and bands and, and I, uh, I, my highlight was putting on a band called Roachford just as they got to number two in the charts. It was Ooh. an absolute fluke, but uh, <laughs> there we go. That was a good night. But um, I really enjoyed that sort of sales and marketing thing. And I remember my, my stepdad was a chartered accountant and he said to me, look, you really need to get a professional qualification. And I thought, okay, let's look at what that might be. And, and he was an accountant. I thought, actually, that's a bit, it's not really me. I was seeing a, a lawyer at the time. I thought, God, that's really hard work. <laughs> really, really hard work. Uh, and my, my uncle, my, my, my stepdad's uh, brother had been, uh, one time he was the only chartered surveyor in the Cayman Islands. And I thought, oh, okay, that seems like a reasonable career choice. He'd actually moved over to America by that point and was working uh, for Jones Lang, actually. Um, um, and we can come back to him later because he became president of the RICS. So there's a, there's a, there's a good family link anyway to the, to the RICS. But um, I thought, yeah, I'll maybe give property a go. So my stepdad was working for University Superannuation Scheme, USS. Mm, yeah. uh, and he said, well, let's see if I could get you some work experience. And this is, you know, in, in the late eighties, this is sort of how you got an opportunity. And uh, he approached James Lang, who were, you know, J the USS for manager and everything else and said, um, you know, any chance that Paul could have a bit of work experience. And they sent me up for a month uh, in what was the compulsory purchase team. 
And that was a pretty specialist team in terms of vowels and everything else. Amazing guy, Richard Asher, who ran that. And actually, someone who's path I've crossed with a number of times, Charlie Dady, who's now an international partner at Cushman and Wakeville. He was on his grad rotation at the time. But I spent a month with them, enjoyed just getting scripts with real estate. I'd be going out holding the end of a tape measure and, you know, that sort of stuff. You weren't, knock, in you weren't knocking on people's doors saying, I'll give you 500 grand to buy your house. Uh, no, not not then. But um, I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll apply to the grad scheme because a lot of the big surveying practices had taken people from traditional surveying courses but they were thinking about bringing people in who were non-cognate from from other degrees um landed a job with james lang which was was great it was the job i wanted and um remember when you walked into 22 hanover square in the day and there was fish ponds and it was glamorous and it was like you know this was sort of like amazing um and i started actually because i'd been a geography student uh, they thought he can write essays, so we'll put him in the research team. So I had a year in research, and actually it started off in a building called Kent House, which was in Telegraph Street in the city of London. Um, so straight into the city, uh, I think we're probably there four or five months, and the, and the department was leaving Kent House, moved over to the to the West End. But it was really, I mean, there were tea ladies, people who pushed trolleys around. People would smoke in offices. It was like, you know, it was just a different sort of era and different time. But actually doing the town reports type of thing, you know, I, I'd go into somewhere like the, the excitement of Crawley and you'd write about the office sector, the retail sector, the industrial sector. So it gave you a really good grounding on property. Meanwhile, at James Lang, they'd set up like a... Uh, a day release course with what was, well, South Bank Polytechnic at the time became South Bank Uni. And you would basically spend Wednesdays with a cohort of other Jones Lang, you know, grads. There were about, there were 20 who went in in my year of which around 10 were non cogs. So we'd also do one night school a week as well. Um, and quite quickly over a couple of years, we got a postgraduate diploma in estate management. Very exciting. You could have turned that into a master's, but I, didn't write another essay. Um, <laughs> is that a theme with your It's not a theme. I don't know. It's I'm just, just thinking, like, I'm you thinking know, nightclub promoter, you, uh, know, that, that, yeah. you know, scraped through your degrees, you said. Were you particularly I got, academic I, at yeah. school? Or? I'd say a, I only scraped through my first year. I okay. did get a two one in the end, so it was all right. But I, I, I yeah, that, that, that's, I, I, you know, you sort of think, God, doing music would have been amazing, but it wasn't. It, it, you know, that, that sensible bit of your brain came in and said, you need a career, or it was, you know, uh, and and so that first year, writing those essays, getting those reports together, good grounding. Then they move, you, you know, you have the grad rotation as well. Um, and actually, so, some of those grads uh, that were on that course, um, that, that, that year of intake, there were some really, you know, people like James Rigg, who's um, Columbia Threadneedle, you've got uh, Nick Dietz, who went through Costco and he's at Scannell now. Duncan Owen, who's had a stellar career. Um, uh, Rob Seabrook, who's at hotels at CBRE, as executive director. So there's a good, you know, it was a good group of people who sort of went through there, some of which were cogs, some were non cogs, build good friendships. And my second move was to what was then property management services. I mean, this was loo roll changing, it was collecting rent, it was really nitty gritty property management around the time. It was 91, 92, so we, we'd seen another recession come in. Um, there were empty office buildings in the city. It, it, was ju it was pretty granular stuff you were doing. But again, it's given you a really good feel for the, the real estate, the rent review process. And, and actually, my, my third placement, the, there wasn't a spot in Vals at the time. So I went into open market rent reviews in 1992. When LNT, there were yeah, advisory. Yeah, but there weren't many rent reviews in 1992. So you were arguing the toss around very small uh, nil increases, nil increases so. measuring abattoirs in Guildford as they're working. It was just like, you know, real, just proper nitty gritty stuff. Um, sorry, man, go on. Oh, no, I was going to say, is that. Um... Did 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 the realization of a career in 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 real estate kind of hit home when you'd been 
banging out these reports you probably didn't want to do. You know, you're kind of arguing over nil increases. You're doing bog roll property management. Yeah. You're kind of like, this This wasn't the glamorous Cayman Island lifestyle that, uh, that I aspired to. That is spot on. In fact, I actually <laughs> applied to leave, I, I applied to the Mars training programme, but... For those who know the Mars training program, there's some pretty stellar people on there. I got through to like a, a last selection, but around the same time, um, I'd been doing a day a week in West End Agency to get some agency experience as well, which again was a totally different world to being in rent reviews or, or what have you. Um, and a space came up in, they said, look, uh, we're gonna take on two nearly qualified, about to be qualified into what was then called the business space team, um, which was very much the leasing business at James Lang. Uh, they covered out of town offices and industrial. There was a change to the use classes order in 1987, which brought it all together under like mm. a homogeneous block. But James Lang were one of, one of a number of businesses that decided to split that. And I went into, I was the first sort of new recruit along with person I would still work with today, Robin Woodbridge or, or, or Woody, into the James Lang business space team. He went to work with Andy Gulliford, who ended up at Seagrove for many years in the um, development side. And I went into leasing. And it was really, industrial was a pretty grubby sector at that point. It wasn't, you know, there's no glamour in industrial. You'd, be, you'd go to sort of gatherings of agents from the James Lang world and the city guys would be there in their chalk stripes and they knew their square mile and everything else. And we were sort of like, you know, hiding in the corner sort of thing. Or, or it's just like, yeah, we're in the industrial team. Oh yeah, you don't make many fees, do you? And it's like, yeah, okay, one of those. But unbelievable How the grounding. Have yeah, well, <laughs> um, um, but unbelievable, you know, grounding in life. And I, I did my first deal after about three months, at least at Britlayer's Arms, and I didn't really look back. It was five years at, at James Lang. And, and James Lang, you, they made you feel like you were like the, cream of the crop in those days. And when other people came, so oh, would you fancy a job? It, it, it was always going to be difficult to leave James Lang to go to another agency. Is actually had the best instructions or is it the best team? Or, or I, I think it, even if they didn't, they made you feel like that. But actually, yeah, they did have a really good reach. And, and the business was also going regional in the mid nineties. So, you know, an office opened in, in Manchester, Leeds, uh, Birmingham, um, I did have an opportunity to go back to Manchester. I'm from the Northwest originally when that office opened. But to me, London was just, it, it had more to it in those days. And, and you yeah, know, I think it's probably different now. You know, you go up to the Northwest and it's incredibly vibrant. But in those days, it was, yeah, actually, I really quite like London and, and what we're doing and, and everything else. And, and so for me to leave uh, James Lang was quite something. It was a bit of a... a a, bit, a little bit of a wrench because you felt very loyal to that that business. But I got, um, one of the things I, I think I've excelled at is in building a network. And I had a very good network of young agents that, that we would go out for beers regularly, we'd see each other at launches, whatever that may be. You'd build really strong links. And some of those, you know, they're still there today. Um, and that is what made me valuable to uh, Gaisley when they, they came knocking. And so was it a case of having done three different rotations, you kind of moved into this business space leasing type world and you thought actually it's a good fit with my personality, my interests, my skill sets. I can be transactional in terms of nature and do deals and it's got the opportunity to go and be sociable as well. Yeah, it, and, it, and it's more fun than banging out boring old reports. It, 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 I mean, you've just nailed it, to be honest. It, it really suited me. And, you know, I think... As you get into a point where you manage a business now and you look at the different roles you need, if everybody was like, you know, I want to let stuff, I want to do this, I want to do that, nothing would ever get done. You know, you still need your people who can make things happen, deliver the solid, solid yeah. stuff. And then you need your guys who can get out there and be, be more that flair, flair. Absolutely. It's getting that balance right in any business. And so you wouldn't move to another advisory agency type role. How and why did you decide to, to make that move to, to Gaisley? Because well, they, they were a merchant shed developer back then, right? Well, not, pre, not, not quite. Is this pre-Brookfield pre -Brook, pre days? Uh, yeah, so, so Gaisley were actually owned by Asda, the supermarket chain in those days. So they were still quite corporate. Um, and, and in those days, there weren't that many big shed developers. There was Gaisley and there was Kings Park and Kings Park became Prologis when 
probably explore that. John, but John Cutts. John Cutts and, and uh, David Keir and Greg Court were running that business. And that was a proper, you know, merchant development business in those days. It was very eat what you kill. Gaisley was much more corporate, collegiate. Really, it was a very easy place for me to go, having been at James Lang. Um, but it's really funny, when you move into development, as an agent, you think you know it all because you've done some deals and you know about the market. And I knew my landlord and tenant and I knew my leases and everything else. But you go client side and you suddenly got to try and do a build to suit at Magna Park in Lutterworth or whatever that may be. And, and you've got to learn. And, Your head's and, on the chopping block. Yeah. And you've got to make the decision if I, it goes right or wrong. And I was really lucky. The the people that I went to work with, um, the, the reason the job opened up is because a couple of people have been poached to go to Kings Park. Uh, but Ian Warboys had just joined uh, Gaisley at the time from Struts, actually. And he was, you know, he's a classic networker and everything else. And I think he saw in me a younger version that could go out and network. And because what Gaisley needed was market reach. They needed to get into the brokers, the people, because the office was up in Lutterworth um, on Magna Park when I joined. Three months later, it moved down to Milton Keynes, but it it, it was still quite parochial in terms of where it was. Um, and what happens normally is, you know, the, the more senior individuals have got their network, but actually there's like gaping hole at yeah. that kind of five year PQE type level, right? And actually- yeah bringing you in to plug that gap. And that was it. That had the, the coverage of the market. Yeah, and, and so I for over four years, I was, you know, the, Pat McGillicuddy, who ended up leading the Gaisley business after uh, John Duggan retired, Andy Griffiths was was my boss at Gaisley and then actually subsequently became my boss at Prologis. It all sort of does, does sort of go full circle some of this. But I had some of the best people I could learn from about development. Pat, the moment I joined, he, he put an arm around me and said, look, best advice I can give you, we've got two or three projects on site. Go, go and speak to the project manager and go to every project meeting. They'd happen monthly or something like that. The project manager would walk me around the site. I'd be asking questions like, why do we do dot level? You know, why do we do it like that? Why do, you know, so you're learning about building heights and the materials that go in there, the depth of yards. All the thing, you know, the constraints, what's happened with planning, all of that just gave me such a good grounding at Gaisley. And, and within a year or two, I was buying my own sites. I was bringing forward, uh, I did a, a site in Crayford, one in Enfield, one up in Redditch, as well as doing some prelets um, at Magna Park as well. Um, and it was just, it was great experience. Love that company. And, and it was a very, there was a point where Walmart bought, but Asda, uh, so you had more of a dynamic American owner uh, of, of that business. But yeah, it was a business that was probably punched above its weight actually um, at the time, but did it in a really good way. They were really there on, even in the early days, what has become ESG and sustainability. It was all high on the agenda of doing things right. You were there for four years or so yeah. before moving to Brixton um, PLC yeah. um, as a director responsible for kind of leasing and development activity. Why did you make the move and what were you responsible for at Brixton? Look, I got offered a, a head of development and leasing role at, at, at Brixton. Um, it was an, Brixton was a really happening company in, in that space at that time. I mean, Tim Wheeler and the team, their mission was really just to blow Slough Estates that was out of the water. They were quite sleepy. Brixton was buying up estates. They were really driving that West London and L London and market. Multi-let. Multi-let. Uh, some bigger projects as well, which is, I think, why they, they went for me, because I'd done build to suit and things like that um, elsewhere. Um, I th think that at the time, it's, it's funny, and I do have this conversation with, I've had it with people who have left my business to go follow the private equity side of things or whatever that might be. And... It's about the grass being greener. And, and sometimes, you know, when you're young, someone will come and I doubled my salary overnight. Um, but it doesn't necessarily make you happy and it doesn't necessarily help. It's around culture is so important in a business. Brixton had amazing people who worked for it. But I remember I was probably in a week or two and I was still very like, I'm gonna, not quite cuddly, but, but you know, this is Gaisley, this is how we do things. We're really nice. We get on with people, everything else. And it was, somebody said to me, look, you really need to grow a second skin if you want to be 
be here because and and yeah, it, it was it was an exacting environment. Uh, as a CEO, Tim really controlled that 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 business, uh, and I I worked really hard. And I'm, it was one of those where um, I no matter what I did, I didn't feel I could do enough to really be whether it's true to myself do what was right for that business and and so I wasn't really looking for another job but then Alan Curtis who had been at Gaisley had left Gaisley went to Kings Park he was running what was then Prologis Prologis bought Kings Park in 1998 um came to me and said Westy do you fancy coming over to Prologis and at, at the time having been at Gaisley Prologis was sort of like is it the dark side you know it was sort of like it, it was a different thing but actually culturally it wasn't as different that by then as it probably had been in the in the merch real core merchant developer days so the lights of cuts and co they'd all gone uh it was a very new team or a newer team of people uh some really good experience in there particularly on the project management side and development management side some very good developers came in and out over a period of time and i went into basically run London in the southeast and and I did that then for for what till 2019 effectively so it was a case of you know going to Brixton you kind of moving for the money and that being the primary driver but actually realizing there's much more to a career or a job than just the financial paycheck there's the other bits around it and the Absolutely. projects and the team and the culture and the opportunity and direction and vision and everything yeah and, and you do things in your head like you, you'll be talking to I was talking to my wife we're just about to have a second child you're laying down, you know, on a score of like one to 10, what's life like now versus what it might be like. And you end up with the rose tinted spectacles on and probably I should have done it. The, the me today would advise the me of then to say, really think about the culture of that business. It, are you really going to fit? Uh, because if you're good enough, you'll, you know, you'll make money over time anyway. And, and everything suddenly becomes very rosy. Yeah. And actually is that the reality? And Please don't, you know, the people were great, the really hardworking people. In fact, some two of ex Brixtoners work with me today, Sally Duggleby and Stuart Davies. Uh, Paul Brideson, who's a, a Brixton asset manager, is, is head of property at the Royal Mail. Is, is, you know, Royal Mail. Th th these people are out there and around and, and really good people. It was just not the right culture for me. So you moved to Prologis. Um, obviously, you just touched on. Um, yeah, a bit of background there, but how how big was was Prologis on a global scale, and where did it operate at the time that you moved? God, that that's a good question. I mean, I, I can't, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head the the, the size. I know at merger, we, when we merged with AMB in twenty eleven, I think we were near the. Oh, but when you moved initially, was so, it one of the big global logistics so, so, players so, at the time? Yeah. Or? So, so what 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 sort of happened? It, there's a guy called Jeff Schwartz who ran the Prologis business. He was CEO. He sadly passed away a, a few years ago. Um, but he was very driven. And, and the business had this idea that we they could agglomerate lots of businesses in the States, put it under one brand, own this massive amount of logistics real estate because logistics is going to be the thing. Um, they were the biggest by a long way, the largest REIT. And they were up, up at, well, have been consistently... Um, but it was very development focused. We didn't really think at the time in those days about, we had people managing our buildings internally, but we didn't really think about what happens when their lease expires because they didn't in those days, you know, we, it was yeah, a fairly new leases, sector yeah. And, and yeah, we'll, we'll see you, you know, we'll be back as and when. And that thought of customer engagement, customer service, we were obviously very keen to do repeat business with people. And that was something that we were good at, but that, that whole world was very much, we were merchant developers and it was basically build scale. Capital is, you know, limitless. Buy the land, build it out. And and what you'll have seen is over that period, I joined 2003 up to 2008, we built, you know, big portfolio, not as focused as we are today. We did a lot of, of refocusing on our portfolio after the GFC, but in those days, we'd be up in Scotland. We had three schemes in Stoke. In fact, we used to say, oh God, we've got another scheme in Stoke. <laughs> but we, we just weren't as 
it, it was about deploying capital, not necessarily everywhere about sensible real estate decisions. And when the music stopped, we had five million square feet of empty buildings. Um, we had, you know, there were no, no occupiers. Uh, it was a really tough coming to ground. And Prologis nearly went under in those days. I mean, there was a classic property week page that was Prologis in pieces. I think that was 2009. Uh, and Jeff Schwartz le left the business or and a guy called Walt Rakovitz who had been COO, he'd left sort of, he'd fallen out because of the way the business was going, came back in and basically saved the, saved the business with that leadership team. And then in 2011, we merged with the fourth biggest REIT, which was AMB. Yep. And that with Hamid Mogadam, who is our CEO still today, that is what started then this whole behemoth behemoth of scale. And, you know, you mentioned at the start, like, you know, it's 1.2 billion square feet. There's nearly a quarter of a trillion dollars of assets under management today. And there's 2,600 people in the business. And, and, and that business and that scale has really grown since that, that merger period and, and beyond. We've done a lot of pruning of the real estate we want to own. We're very focused in terms of where we are, where we want to be. But it's still a very entrepreneurial business when you think about other other areas like data centers, life sciences, we may touch on that later. But it, it, it it's that culture of, honestly, change in our business is continual, but actually it keeps you on your toes. And as, as a team, we've got to really, you know, be absolutely on our metal to try to stay at the front. So what role did you join Prologis as um, back in 2003? So I was a development director, effectively a development director. I joined as a, I think, I can't remember whether I was a vice president or I think I was a vice president. Then I became a first vice president. We've only got one of those left in business now. It's a title that doesn't really exist much anymore. And then I became an SVP, a senior vice president in 2008. But that was very much London and South East, more big box development yeah. uh, around... M25, I did a scheme in Swindon, went up the M1, Dunstable, did a scheme around Heathrow, um, Northampton, sort of Milton Keynes was probably generally about as far as I as I did. I, so I did one scheme in Northampton, but it was those sort of areas that, that we'd focus on, primarily near a motorway junction, pretty much classic big box development. And was it just you or were you responsible for driving and leading a team at that so stage? So the, there was a team in the southeast. Of, it was quite a small team. There's a guy called Jeremy Greenland who's just been... PLP? Yeah, though he's moved into like a board role now. Neil Dickinson, uh, who's now CEO of that business. Uh, we were very much that that London and, and southeast team. John Book joined us uh, at one point. Uh, yeah, and it was... We were out there and and just trying to find land, open up opportunities. But but the competitive environment was nothing like it is today in terms of the number of people wanting to get into into the sector. So it was still the the kind of the ugly duckling of the you know office yeah. and retail with a golden golden child, yeah. right? Um, and industrial was just or this business space was just that kind of yeah. And people on the side. people called it industrial. It wasn't really logistics then. Like you know we are it's logistics now. It's, it, it's very different. To, to how that perception was and how that perception has, has evolved. We had a bigger team in the Midlands. So there were people like um, Matt Byram, who's now leads Panatoni, uh, Ollie Bertram, who's with him, um, Alan Sargent, who's just retired, who um, I worked with for many years, just absolute great developer. People have learned so much from Sarge over the years. Um, Kate Bedson was with us for some time. She's now at Seagrow. You know, there's, there's a whole load of people who were really, really good at their game and um, and learnt a lot in those periods. James Craddock worked for me for a period of time. He's now head Seagrow. of Seagrow MD. So yeah, it, it's small old world. Yeah, small um, world. So how did your role change then, having kind of gone into development director? Because it it shifted to being more leadership as well, right up to kind of present day. How did that evolution start? And so. I think my biggest change in my, in, in sort of my tack, I was happy being a developer. I loved, uh, it, it, it suited my personality we talked about almost at, at the start. Um, but I got to, I think I'm going to say around 2015, 2016, and I went to see 
Andy Griffiths, who's my 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 UK region head at the time, and said, "Look, Andy, I've been doing this for years. Uh, I didn't know he was going to retire, but I said at some point, whether it's here or somewhere else, I'd like to be leadership ready to to manage a business." Um, and so often in the property world, they just you, you you get a leadership job because you're good at doing deals, and nobody teaches you really how to be a leader. Um, I was obviously convinced I would be absolutely natural at it, but Andy actually let me have. I had some coaching back then. Someone I'm still close to now who's been absolutely brilliant in terms of shaping my career. A guy called James Farrow at Curium, um, and. James took me on a journey. Um, and so that, Andy said, okay, yeah. appreciate the aspirations. You're a great developer or yeah. developer. You've got aspirations to be in a leadership seat, but you know, I'm going to give you some coaching to kind of get there and see if, well, if actually the reality is you still want to do it. Yeah. And, and this is like, you know, this is a few years before it actually, you know, the, the opportunity arose at, at Prologis. So James, I did a 360 now, most times people do 360s and it's like, it's all the nice stuff. This is one like, you know, pick on the areas that he can really improve and, and this, that and the other. And, and obviously I, obviously I've marked myself, I'm, I'm a reasonably on a scale of one to five, I'd be pushing myself three, four, five <laughs> or whatever. And anyway, when, when it came back, he's, J- James warned me, he said, look, you're going to find this really hard. Uh, and I sat down and I opened this survey and you're reading this stuff. And was it all anonymous? Yeah, but you can sort of, you well, you've who, got an you idea. Who, you you know whether it. your peers have done it or your manager's written it right, or, or people externally or, or whatever. And so it goes through your strengths and mine were like, you know, some of my communication, my network, all, all of those sort of things, to, you know. And then there's other bits that you suddenly think, that's not me, that's not me. How could he write that? How could they? And... and, and you go through, and, and, and actually some of the scores that Andy gave me were like twos and ones. They're like, Your ego like, suddenly yeah, getting really like bruised. popped. But actually it was probably the most, it was the best thing that happened in terms of my journey that, that, that could have happened. Because actually you go through the whole shock, anger, <laughs> realisation, acceptance sort of cycle and actually, working with your coach, you say, why didn't you ask Andy why he scored you that way? And, oh, okay. Rather than just fume, <laughs> go and ask him. And actually, Andy, can I have half an hour with you? And actually, it turns out Andy is a low marker. <laughs> Three to him is really good in his eyes, right? So if I was going to tell you, it's like, actually, there's room for improvement, but you're doing all, you know. So actually, once you get that context, think things are better. Other things, when you start to read things from some of my younger team members at the time, it, it would be like, I'd be so engrossed in a deal. Someone would come up and you'd, you'd no, someone would be behind you. It's like, yeah. And, and my, the, the perception I was giving out was like, basically, what do you want? Tell me what I need. Tell, tell me what you, you, need, you need to know. I'll tell you and basically bugger off. off that is how I was coming across. I'm thinking, that's not me. I'm a team player. I'm this. But what James taught me is that you don't have to tweak the dial much to really make a difference to how people perceive you. Um, and so for me, it was quite, it, it, we just worked on something. It's like, look, next time someone comes up, turn around, give them eye contact, say, look, is this, I am really busy now. Is this something that I can help you with instantly? Or, or could we find 10 minutes later in the day, we'll sit down, we'll do it, go and sit at another table, break away from your computer, things like that. Within six months, Andy came up to me and said, I've been getting amazing feedback about you. I'll move you to a two and a half. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll move you to a two and a half, yeah. Uh, but, but that, and I, I tell people today that dial moving bit is really, look at what you're good at. You'll still be good at those. Ask people two or three things that you could do better. And you'll probably find if you ask enough people, those sort of things will come up. And actually, if you can grasp those, then work on them a bit you'll be so much better as a as a professional as a person as a leader whatever that may be so that that to me at that moment really got me into my personal development i mean i've still got a load of i, I buy a load of management books 
I don't really get to open them. If someone's told me they're really good or or the business will be having a global leadership retreat, we'll read a synopsis of it and everything else. And it's really good stuff. But ultimately, a lot of this, you're trying to just take those bits that you've learned from other people that that you try to synthesize into being a, you know, a leader today. So it was t- 2019 that seen that ability for me to, I guess, you know, develop personally and and I was offered the region head role. Quick one from me. If you haven't already subscribed or followed this show on the podcast or app where you listen or watch, please do. It takes 10 seconds and helps tremendously. I've got really big plans for the People Property Place podcast and that one small action really, really helps grow the show and the presence and enables us to keep doing what we're doing. So if you haven't already, please follow or like on the platform you watch or listen to. Thanks so much. And so what were you taking on by moving into a regional regional head role? Paint oh, yeah. a picture of like- So that is basically like, right, Westy, you're going to run the business. Um, Full PL responsibility for the UK? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, and for you know and all the people and and everything else so there's a huge cultural piece there as well because you're setting the direction of the business the we previously had myself running the south london and the southeast robin woodbridge woody running the midlands and north the challenge was woody was going to have to step up to take on both which was a bigger role for him and and you know with a team a bigger team as well that that has challenges i needed to focus on, you know, our thing, other things like our operations business. You know, we we collect 260, 280 million pounds of rent. You know, we've got to make sure we're still doing that. So, you know, trying to make sure that side of the business is, is working, making sure the development management team are, are producing. So all, all of those bits, you go from being a siloed in your little development bubble. Trying uh, to do deals, really yeah. focused on like the minutiae and working in it to try to work on the business Absolutely. and take a bit more of a helicopter view. And it's a, that, and the, our business talks a lot about joining the dots. You know, one of my key roles is to try and join those dots between Prologis in the UK and other teams of Prologis and things that we do around the world and how we bring all that, all that together. So can you just paint a picture of what the UK portfolio is as it stands today and also the team and headcount and office yep. locations? So, uh, portfolio is, it's around about 33 million square feet. Um, there's a few other bits. We've got a couple of retail parks and, and, um, we've got some life sciences as well now on, on top of that. Um, we've got a land bank that could deliver around 15 million square feet, but we're continually looking to refill that land bank. We, we, we've got a strategic, effectively a strategic, one side of our business is strategic land, one side is big box development, and another side really is around the urban last touch assets in, in London. Um, the uh, portfolio is about six billion of assets under management in, in, in Sterling. Um, two and a half percent of UK GDP goes through our buildings um, over a year. So that's a, a really good stat in terms of how things 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 shape. Um, all our money is from the US, so we're a big so foreign direct in, investor into the UK. We, we've invested billions in the UK over years, and and hopefully, you know, more to come. And that's from a development perspective, but also kind of your capital solutions and strategic. Um... Yeah, the strategic capital business. So, so we 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 hold the majority of our assets in a couple of funds. One is a fifty fifty joint venture with Norges. The other is an open ended fund with a called Pelf with a basket of of investors, and they're two of the largest. Well, Pelf is the largest fund in Europe by by a long way, and then you've got Pelp, which is I think it's about the fourth largest. I might be wrong, but so our, our business on the ground, there's about seventy people in the UK, but we we have a very much a matrix sort of org, org system. So not everybody has a direct line report to me anymore. So I, I, my direct line reports of capital deployment operations, things like our legal function in house report to a European function for sort of corporate and ethics reasons. 
Um, and also, I'll, I guess, just for like synergy across correct. cross countries, yeah. so like process and things are all kind of standardised. Our, our development management business now reports globally because that's about getting best in class processes through the whole globe. Typically, we do stuff in the UK, and we might not. We, well, we might not think it's applicable somewhere else, or it could happen in Poland or wherever. And, and it's around bubbling those ideas up. That's why they're in that that sort of. Um, um, reporting line and then there are other bits of our business now that have grown we've got something called essentials so uh, we've got operating essentials which is very much helping customers fit out their buildings so we can do racking lighting sprinklers that is all coming in as a business line so whilst they report into Europe they're also working really closely with our leasing and capital deployment teams in the UK so they're, they're very intertwined we've got an energy business as well with people locally and in Europe and in the US um, there's also a mobility business that's coming out of Europe as well which is around EV charging and that's going to be you know as HGV charging in future and things like that. There's a real Huge growth business there as well. So so all of these things sit in the UK. The strategic capital business, there's a chunk of them that are based in the office in Soho. They don't report to me, but again, I've, I was in a meeting this morning helping them with a an investor presentation. And, and that's sort of what we do. We, you know, that capital feeds our funds, which allow us to do what we do on the ground. So it's that sort of virtuous circle you, you're trying to, work through all of that so you mentioned about offices so i've got three offices uh solly hall's our biggest office um about 45 50 people in there london 15 or so and then we've got a small office in king's hill which is in kent which came out of the liberty purchase we did back in 2020 just before covid 2020 oh, it was 2020 2020 and uh they're very much managing king's hill business park and a couple of other things and for you, have you enjoyed the, the switch from being developer to more, more leadership, more oversight? Has that kind of piqued your curiosity and your ability to like learn new skills and, um, and broaden your horizons by kind of transitioning? Yeah, I, I've actually enjoyed it more than I thought I would. Um, again, it's that bit, you don't know what you don't know. Um, James Farrow, he came back in to help me again at the start as I, transitioned a, a, across to the leadership role and he, he it was it was just little things like and and like just think you know how do you want to describe yourself as a leader how do you want to be seen how are you gonna set out your stall and that's the bit for a leader for me it's that culture bit what does what you know what does me what do my values stand for and how do I get that culture working through this team and that, you know, there's a big piece of our culture around innovation, continuous improvement, trying to do things better every time. And it's trying to keep that drive going because at times you can sort of feel you're smacking your head against a wall a bit. I think that happens in a lot of organisations. But actually that that push really defines what how the UK business is in terms of the prologist world and hopefully how we're seen externally as well. One of the things about your culture is kind of seeking forgiveness rather than permission. So that's not that's not carte blanche to do anything. But but things like we, we've been really keen to test things out. Um, whether that suddenly will make the yard depth deeper or will we'll do something slightly different in terms of how we're constructed a building or we putting a games area in or um, looking at an outdoor gym or, or whatever that may, may be from a part life perspective or we'll buy a Victorian <laughs> warehouse on the edge of the city of London and learn as much as we can about multi-story and whether we could make it work and, and how that was going to be and, and that was a I remember we went to investment committee and, and we've got we've got you build trust with investment committee over over many years. And generally our projects have worked well. And when things have gone wrong, we've always held our hands up and said, look, this is development, stuff happens. Sometimes we can't control it. But generally, you know, we've we've got that that kudos. So when we went, um, I'm trying to think when this, this was probably 2020-ish. Um, we'd identified this building. We bought it for about 25 million. And, and at investment committee, one of the, Guy said, so this is a sort of 25 million pound experiment, is it? It's like, yep. And he's like, well, make sure 
you you know you write down what you learn from it and report it back. And actually, we sold it for another. We we got away with our shit. We sold it for about twenty six million because we realised just how hard it was going to be to to do logistics via lifts with very small yards, which that building had. And I, that building's gone. I think half of it is going to be has gone to self storage, and half of it will be like trendy office, you know, warehousey office type space. But, you know, in terms of what we learn and how we're applying that with what we learn from Japan in terms of our team out there and the multi-level and what might happen in London, I mean, that is gold dust. Yeah, I can imagine, you know, just given you are the the largest global leader in, in logistics, there must be so much international sharing data information that is um, that is pushed around um, for you to all kind of learn from, right? Yeah, the, the, there is... Oh, sometimes there's almost too much data. You know, we're man. We're a lot. There is a lot of data. We are, though. You know, that journey to becoming more data centric as an organisation. And when you've got the scale, one point two billion square feet, you have a sight on the market, on goods flows, on supply chains, on what customers are doing. Way ahead of that is, anyone else. That's way ahead, and that is the bit that we're capitalising on with these other business lines and what have you. And data is absolutely fundamental to that in terms of how we collect it, what we do with it, and and how we how we we do that. I mean. I am, I'm not going to say I'm a Luddite, but AI is, I've just been opened up to AI recently. We've got a prologist related AI system and it absolutely blows your mind how that is going to revolutionize the way that we work. And you, the beauty is you've got the size and scale to be able to fully realize the returns if you set it up correctly in the first yeah. place. Yeah. And, and okay, it's funny that that, we talked about that do it and apologize later sort of attitude or mindset. And the business would like more people to do that in the business. But I think in corporates, people can get that fear, oh, what if it goes wrong? Where actually, when things go wrong, and as long as it's managed, you know, in terms of the scale, that's when you learn. That is the time. We, we learn, yes, we do learn things. And we have a, every project that we do, and this is, very much thanks to Woody and his mindset around that process improvement and how we do things better is um, is to review every project. Generally though, you're reviewing successful projects because they've leased up and we've made some money and, and it's gone in the fund and you know, customers happy, we're happy. But it's the learning you get when things don't go right. That is absolutely key. And, and that's what you'll, you'll be a better business on the back of. Talk to me about um, data centers and also the foreign to life science as well. So the Prologis as a business, fundamentally it is logistics, global logistics, everything you see. But our business has a very entrepreneurial heart. So data centers at the start, I mean, we, we didn't, I mean, I thought I was really, really good when I let building a, in, at Heathrow or near Heathrow for like a pound a foot more than what the rent was because it was a data center. That was eight years ago. And what we know now- We left a lot of money on the table. We left quite a bit of money on the table, but that's why they were data center experts, you know? But but you've seen it. You've seen it with Gaisley or GLP, sorry, Goodman, Prologis. We, people are ta have learned, we've gone out and got that, that sort of knowledge. And what we have is this massive portfolio. And coincidentally, quite a lot of it, there's quite a bit around Washington and Dulles, and that's a huge data center cluster. We've got a good bit around Heathrow. That's a good data center cluster. Schiphol, we've got lots of buildings around Schiphol and Frankfurt and, and on and on. So it's around those, you know, higher and better value uses. And how do you, how do you get that? Now, the key for the data center is Fibre is one thing, but power is the other. And that is the biggest challenge, certainly in West London, that we face today. So that business is opportunistic to a point, but it's one that is going to grow more and more as we see the growth of AI and everything that comes about. That doesn't have to be in West London. It can be further away. 
I think our business will grow in that level, but it, it's going to be, you know, we've got a great footprint to work from. And it's about what repurposing, repurposing existing sheds that are in those perfect locations yeah. with power or connectivity to yeah. be able to take advantage of it in five, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten x your, your yeah. returns rather than keep it as a, an existing and, shed. And you, you know, or scrape it, and you've got a site to to start again because the values there are, as you say, you know, they are Massive. exponential in terms of. But the capital that needs to go into some of that is also huge, huge, and you know, the the working with those global. Uh, hyperscalers is, a, you know, it, it, we're doing a big complex for one of them. I think in in Texas at the moment. And we, we, th these things are happening within our our business globally. So that the data center bit, it will continue to evolve within ProLogic because of the footprint that we've got and the access to power. Hopefully, will allow that. I mean, we've got two buildings that we built speculatively in West London that. We've got some power now through the secondary market, but we're waiting for the confirmation on dates of this power station to the west of London. And they will be too ready to plug in data centers, ready to go. And we've got another eight in the portfolio already, but some of which are these dark shells, some of which are on slightly better terms because we learned a lot more as we got closer to that. And life uh, science, is that a similar similar idea? So, right location? Yeah, well, it... <laughs> This is very much the entrepreneurial piece and that higher and better value uses. So, so in, in Southern or in parts of California, uh, like the South Bay area of San Francisco, we, we have had similar little warehouse buildings where other life science developers have come along, either bought land offers or taken a ground lease and they've built big life sciences. For, for us in the UK, it was slightly different. And when we bought Liberty, uh, back in 2020, we there were f four or five acres of land at Cambridge Biomedical Campus, and they were held under option. Uh, we didn't really have much value attributed to them in the in the purchase thing because we didn't really understand it. And I suddenly started getting phone calls from you know big uh, players in the market saying, "Would you sell that, or would you come out of that?" And I'm like, "There's got to be something here." So Andrew, that's the old agent in yeah, you, isn't it? Well, you know, still don't lose it. Yeah. So so Andrew Andrew Blevins Blevs, who was the he ran the Liberty UK business. He's a he's been working on that Cambridge Biomedical Campus since two thousand and three, and we, me and Woody, me and Woody went there, and um, he's given us a tour, and it's like, well, there's Patworth Hospital, you know, leading heart and lung hospital. There's Adam Brooks. There's the University Teaching Hospital. Oh, there's AstraZeneca's new global headquarters. Oh, there's the Medical Research Council where there's loads of Nobel Prize winners in there. There's something about this. So we went, we went to the business and said, look, let's buy out. We bought out Countryside, who were the long-term partner who wanted out. We had to retweak our options so we could build some spec. And we built our first speculative building hundred odd thousand square feet finished it last september had it fully let by october november and um the intention we, we we can probably do about half a billion of investment there just in terms of that there's another couple we're in for planning buildings we're in for planning for at the moment there's i think opportunities to bring our strategic land head together with the life science piece but also look at how that overlap between it, somewhere like Cambridge is pure discovery. It, it, it's where the, the boffins are, you know, the really bright people are there making things, inventing things and what have you. Probably not too far away, there's an opportunity for an ecosystem where you could have manufacturing. You, you know, you see where Stevenage is, for example, and you, you've got an opportunity, I think, for that life science to sort of merge into uh, uh, medicine sheds. I think there's an opportunity there. So, so getting into this sector gives us that opportunity, but also it's a, you know, it, it, it it's a great way to grow our business. We're learning a lot. Are we going to grow this in in the UK and 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 look at how we can can really go with that? Yeah, we we we're you've definitely got going. We've got, got a platform. Location. We've got the best location in the country. You can take an, an entrepreneurial uh, yeah. view and highest and best use for a particular. Uh, asset and location with the right use class and and demand to to be able to um, make it stack up. How how do you just see the the logist industrial and logistics market generally at the moment? So it's tough, or it, it's 
I, I think the capital markets have, have I mean, they've been stable for three quarters in terms of valuations and so on. So capital markets, there isn't a huge amount of supply and the investors, there's, there's capital there to buy to buy assets. So, and it's quite deep in terms of a buyer list that for, for decent product. The occupier market is tougher than it's been for quite some time. But then we had a, it was bizarre during COVID. I mean, I, in the 30 years I've been involved in, in industrial and logistics, rarely did you have two occupiers fighting over one building. We'd have three or four and it was like, who are we going to let down? Yeah, they're you know, customers and, and everybody getting in the class thinking, oh, this is really easy. All these buildings pre-let. Well, actually, the reason you build void periods into development appraisals is because they don't all pre-let. And I think we're just at, at the moment, there's a bit of that period post-COVID where a lot of the, the three PLs are, are, are look at, have looked at their supply chains. You saw Amazon out of the market. Now they're rumoured to be back in, but they're doing, they're doing stuff. I think that general e-commerce... Growth. I mean, we we hit something like thirty six percent of all shopping was online during COVID. It dropped back. It's dropped back to about twenty eight percent. But that is still massively higher than it was in twenty nineteen. And that path is still, you know, it is still going to go. So, I think that e commerce piece will continue to drive the market. Um, supply chains have always you know, revamp themselves, optimise themselves and so on. And I think that that you've got buildings that are some pretty old buildings now. When you look at ESG standards and everything else, where things are going, that's going to be another another driver. Some people need more power and what have you for their buildings. And that's going to be a, another dial mover as well. So I think the sec the sector's set pretty fair on the on the on the big box side. Uh it's just at the moment we're in a bit of an icky point where the vacancies ticked up, but it's nothing like that, you know, for us, nothing like that 5 million square feet we had in, in 2009. Um, the second, second hand buildings for us seem to be moving a bit quicker. And I think that's because a lot of the capex is already in those buildings for occupiers. So they might be racking in their lighting, spring, you know, they're all ready to go in. Whereas if you take a new building, you've still got quite a lot of fit out to do as well. But that that's something we're we're seeing there on the urban side. Again, you know, we, rents have got high in London, um, undoubtedly. But the fact is, the capital is still growing um, in terms of the size of population. Um, yes, Labour might let a little bit of green grey belt, you know, go, but residential will be far away there but you know we always say if you want to build 300,000 new homes a year that's 300,000 letterboxes you really need to be thinking about where you position your logistics so that that can be at the most efficient when you're in somewhere like London you know you know in a congested city you have to be close to chimney pots you have to be close to those populations so for me that that urban logistics piece is still set pretty well I think there's how that translates into other cities where you could have big boxes not that far away from from the main population might be a different story. I, I don't know. I mean, we are only in London when it comes to the multi-let, really. So I don't have that feel for other other locations. But I feel long term, again, that's got to be good. And also with London, it's the higher and better value uses. Maybe not a data centre, but it could be resi. It could be multi-level, you know, in a, in a few years' time if you've got the right shape site, right size of site and everything else. What are some of the challenges that you're you're faced with? Um, so I think for the sector, I think the biggest challenge we've got is the perception of logistics as being poor jobs, um, ugly boxes, nothing going on in there. Yeah, contracts. Yeah, and all of this. And, and it, you know, it, it, it's, I think the industry, you know, during COVID, the sector really became, I'm going to say we were like the fourth emergency service. You know, without those buildings, people wouldn't have got their food. People wouldn't have got, got their stuff. You know, I re we remember speaking to someone like Sainsbury's at the time and they were saying, it's like Christmas every day. And you're like, oh, that must be great. No, no, it's absolutely <laughs> shocking. You know, we are having to manage crisis manager. So, so logistics had its moment in the sun suddenly and then it's all forgotten as we as we get back to uh as we get back to normal life post covid and when you look at the sector and what it can offer the country 
in terms of jobs and skills. Um, we've got something at, at Daventry, our rail freight terminal at Durf called, the, we call it the hub, but it, the, it's home to the Prologis uh, Logistics and Warehouse Training Programme. And we are taking people who've never worked before or, or from other sectors and putting them through training so they can get into into the sector. Uh, that is amazing. And that's not something we have to do. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. It helps our customers. It generates amazing social value. And it, it's, yeah, when you see that some of the people who are getting through and having the opportunity to work, is it, it's great. The, the skills bit is massive. And I know the, the, the new government is very much around skills. The other piece is around energy. So you could be thinking around, you know, UQA, the UK Warehouse Association, talk about the opportunity to have 15 gigawatts of of, of solar across the roofs of every warehouse in the UK. You know, you, that's massive in terms of being able to help power the UK. But our energy network is old. Um, we don't have very good feeding tariffs. And we can power a warehouse an ambient warehouse, probably without 25% of the roof covered, but you've got 75% that you're not using. I mean, it's an absolute goal for, you know, we need to find a way to address that. And that I think can help move the perception of, 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 of the sector as well. And then there's that whole piece around economic growth. You know, 7% of the UK's population is in logistics. Um, I think it's 232 billion of GVA to the UK comes through the sector. So it is this massive sort of hidden sector that that when it puts its head above the parapet in COVID was like amazing. And then you've got the other side of it that's like, well, you know, the jobs are crap and this, that, and the other. But actually, yeah, it's one of the few sectors where you can start work on the shop floor and you can be CEO. You know, the number of women in the sector is 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 growing and and you know really important the amount of people who've never had a degree who've gone through that sector as well it, it, it's a real sort of hidden gem that should not be hidden it's critical infrastructure we need it out there and and so for me it, that is a big challenge so I, I sit on a bpf uh logistics board with logistics property board with david sleeth uh from from seagro uh bruce topley's on there from glp uh charlie howard from logicor uh colin um Godfrey. is on from tritax and others so the, there's uh, andrew dittman as well and there's some customers on there we've got amazon represented and, and others so but it's trying to as a as an industry we're very used to doing our own little projects yeah and being very happy you know, I'm all right, Jack. But there's a point the sector has to come together and have a voice because that's the way government will listen if you've got a united voice. So that's something I'm passionate about and the the there's something we need to do more of in the sector as well. We need to champion what it does. You talked on Durft, yeah. um, which has got um, rail freight through it. Yeah. And I think um, there's a big drive at the moment at... Um, taking 60 million lorries off the roads by by using rail freight. Something you did a couple of years ago um, is you got Francis Bourgeois around one of your um, properties. It, it, does that just talk to the kind of the innovation and entrepreneurial spirit that you touched on, kind of bringing in a, an influencer, as it were, to kind of highlight yeah. and, and talk about your buildings? Or is it more about kind of trying to level up building launches uh, that have typically had, you know, whether it's celebrities or driving range or helicopters or food trucks turn up? to kind of get leasing agents in. Yeah, so, all right, well, do you want to come back to the launches? But I think with, with Fran <laughs> Francois, it was absolutely, it was something that Frankie Hawken, who's our head of marketing, had this brainwave. She'd seen him doing his YouTube stuff and, and everything else. And honestly, when it was mentioned to me and, and Woody, we're like, really? I mean, this is one of those things that corporately, this, so this is the do it and apologise later bit. We're saying, right, okay, it sound the, the key you to go it one was, or two ways. Yeah, <laughs> the key to it was trying to get the sector perceived in a different way by younger people, and he's got millions of followers TikTok, and, and everything YouTube, else. Yeah. And and so we yeah we 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 did a number of I think two or three with him. Uh, he was most pleased when we got his his favourite 
loco at dirt class 66 yeah I, I can't remember what it was in fact but but he managed to ride i forgot what the name of it was but he managed to ride that logo but but in terms of what that did for us the sector it's a bit of fun but also there's a serious side to that which is actually how important rail can be to logistics one train takes 60 70 hgvs off the road you know so it, there's a massive opportunity for rail to be part of an integrated um supply chain and everything else and that's why but he was just somebody yeah so that was one of those give it a go see see if it works so that was bit of fun. a bit of fun but also serious in why we were trying to do it and what it was meant to make mean for for the sector and so on um one of our colleagues phil oakley was on the scooter with him or walking with him around a building and Phil got some really funny uh, comments on the Insta after it, actually, <laughs> around his... Yeah, anyway, I'm not saying no more. We'll have to go and check them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check, check, check those out. But, but yeah, and then launches. Because um, there is, a you know, you bring helicopters or, 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 or people bring helicopters. Yeah, we... You know, dry, golf simulators. And... We, we've tried to move away from that. I, 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 and I tell you, I, as an agent... I used to have to go to buildings to see buildings. Before you then put into clients. You put into the clients or you lease it. Yeah, it was part of what you did. You got to know the market and everything else. So I don't, it should be part of your job that you go. It's nice if you get a, I mean, I got a CD once or or something like that. Or you might have got a rugby shirt or something like that. In the 25 day. quid, yeah. John Lewis voucher. I think it's gone, that in certain places may have gone a bit too far. But as a as a big corporate as well, we can only do so much, so much on gifting and, and stuff that's right and appropriate and, and whatever. But I mean, it, our launches, I think, have changed a bit from, I, I, I do find it quite, well, I look on LinkedIn and it's like, wow, I had a fantastic launch today. Someone's, someone's posted and there's like three people outside a coffee van. It's like, it's all a bit formulaic. Can we do things differently? So we did something different at Durf last year where we had some beat, a beatbox band. It's all right, the beat of logistics and stuff. That, that, that worked pretty well. So we try to do some things that are a little bit different. The days of, I mean, we launched a scheme in Dunstable in 2007 and we had a like a curry olympics we turned this building into a curry, into like an indian restaurant and um had various activities and <laughs> nowadays we that stuff no doesn't wash no but i i want people to come to buildings because they need to know what those buildings do what, what what's also really key is yeah, developers today are putting so much more into their buildings, and, and agents need to know that what they, those buildings potentially can do for their customer versus what another building might not have. And I, yeah, for me, that's part of the job. So launches are great, um, but it, it really, for me, get the people around the building and make sure they're able to compare apples with apples is 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 the key. And sell the building appropriately. Yeah. Well, look as we as we draw this to a close. Um, Westy, a question that I ask everyone who comes on the podcast is, if I gave you £500 million worth of capital, who are the people, what property, and which place would you look to deploy that capital? So I know I can't say I'll just put it in ProLogis shares because that, that, that's, yeah, that, that kind that, of goes that, that's against too easy. The it, it goes against it. So um, I, I, this is one of those that you, you think about and you think, God, am I going to sound really stupid or can I make it sound sound like I know what I'm talking about. So so a couple of things. So there have been, so Prologis is like a university. We joke about the Prologis university. People leave our business and go on to do great things. So there are a number of people I know who I've worked with over the years that if I had a bit of money, I'd probably say, here you go, guys. Well, come, um, come and work with me. Or, well, you've probably named about 67. I, I've known quite a few people. Well, it's, it's a network, isn't it? But, um, I, I, you know, so so there's, there's a couple of guys, uh, who uh, Ollie? I'll say Ollie Bycroft and, and uh, James Wright, who who worked for me a while ago, have got their own little business going, and they're starting. You know, they're they're doing well. Or they're getting themselves going. So they they know their numbers. They know their stuff. Um, I really like the life science bit in Cambridge. If I could go and drop some money and just say right, I, but in the right place, not every building is going to be a life science building. It's just not. Um, it's not like the answer to every problem an office might have if it's not letting or it's vacant today. But I'd love to have a. I'd love to be able to do something like that and really something that can generate some sort of discovery that you think, wow, that was pretty pretty cool. That's just 
not necessarily solve cancer, but it, it's been able to solve solve something in that way. And then uh, probably put a bit into the covered land around London. You know, if we could buy, I mean, we've bought a couple of retail parks that we think could be really good for multi-story or whatever that may be in due course. But getting into the, something that pays you an income while you're working out what you do with it is pretty good business. It's better than sitting on empty land that's burning its head off. So there's a few sort of ideas there that, that I could probably spend 500 million on. Well, Paul, you've um, had a phenomenal career. Um, ever since you've kind of moved out of those three rotations that you had thinking, what is this world of real estate? You've kind of found your own niche and, and, and excelled right from the bottom all the way up to the top. And um, I'm really excited to see uh, as we kind of hopefully start this new cycle where you and the Prologist team take the business and, and the deals you hunt down. That's brilliant. Yeah. And look, Matt, really enjoyed it. Thanks for your time. And uh, yeah, thanks for asking some great questions as well. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of People, Property, Place podcast. If you found it insightful, feel free to share it with a friend or colleague. Give us a rating, like or comment. It helps tremendously. It'd be great to hear from you on LinkedIn. I'm super open-minded to recommendations of guests that we should have on the show or areas of the market we should explore further. So do drop me a message. The People, Property, Place podcast is powered by Rockbourne. The team recruit leadership and future leadership hires for real estate owners, funds, investors, and developers. So if you're looking to hire top talent for your business, head over to the website, www.rockbourne.com, where you'll be able to find a wealth of information, or feel free to drop me a message on LinkedIn. Have a great day wherever you are and I look forward to catching you next time.